stretch that out as much as possible here. Uh, so yeah, I guess the, I'm Torin, I'm from Des Moines. If you want to catch me on Twitter, that's cool. I write JavaScript for money, so I'm living the dream. <laughs> that used to be a big deal, but I think the idea is now like everyone's here, so everyone's like getting paid to write JavaScript for money, so this is part of my really rough comedy tour of like when you know you've aged out of JavaScript. One of those is like semicolons aren't used, and the other one is people are just all paid to write JavaScript, which is just kind of foreign. So anyway, uh, one thing I wanted to call out was this uh, quote. I can't remember where I found this quote, but uh, it really is what I hope I leave everybody with today, which is that uh, at some point along my journey, test driven development, my mind was so stretched by the idea or the process that I actually found it hard to write software any other way. And this quote, I think, points that out where it gets stretched to a point where you can't think of it in any other way. And so, in fact, today what you're going to see, the live coding I'm going to do, is literally how I work every single day. It's obviously scripted to look really fancy and make me look like I know how to use Vim, all that stuff aside. <laughs> don't get excited about that. If you like Sublime, that's fine. Um, I could have done this as Sublime. I honestly just don't know how to use anything else now. So uh, I hope your mind <laughs> by, by the end of this is as stretched out as mine is now. Uh, anybody ever seen this diagram? Sweet, nobody. OK, one person. No, <laughs> so I, I bring this diagram up not to throw out any trivia or challenge anyone, but mainly because we're going to talk about some things that are kind of religious in the programming community. I'm going to say words like integration test, and then you're going to disagree with my definition. So what I'm going to mention here early on is that pretend there's like the Men in Black movie where Will Smith like flashes you and then you forget for a short time and I'm going to rewrite history in your mind. And really what I'm asking is that for the next 45 minutes you sort of unlearn or forget what your formal definition of unit, integration, acceptance, etc. is, only because I need a common vocabulary to talk to you guys for the rest of this conversation. Otherwise, when I say integration test, you're just going to get that built up tension of like, he's been wrong, and you probably put it on the internet. <laughs> these, jokes, these jokes aren't coming across very well, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the point is, I'm going def to define how these work, um, and they don't have to be your definition. They just have to be kind of the definition for the next half hour, 45 minutes. So the first one I want to talk about is acceptance testing. And acceptance testing in the pyramid is one of the higher up tests. It's a little different, though, and I want to make it known that it's, it's not selenium. And what you'll see today is sometimes it's, it's confusing when I say acceptance test if I'm talking about selenium. Uh, Selenium, this example, if I had to point it out, would be probably in the UI testing scenario, and that little cloud above it would be sort of the manual human testing. If you have a QA team in your company, or maybe you're part of that team and you do testing, um, I think you still need those. And what you'll see today is not me standing up here saying, we don't need those people, we don't need those jobs. Ultimately, what I'm going to show is how do those jobs work alongside the programming team or the software team that wants to deliver features. So acceptance testing in the definition today is, uh, I actually heard this really good definition someone mentioned where they said, they use this mnemonic, like I accept the user is going to enter their name and I accept the user is going to click save and there's going to be you know, a redirect that happens. It's kind of how the, the end user, the consumer of your product thinks about it. So you have a different kind of hat as, as we go through all these different types of tests. So this is like the highest level test. The benefit of this test that you'll see today is that it thinks or it runs like a Selenium test would at the highest level, but it's not actually uh, driven out by a browser. It runs in JavaScript. So the runtime is a little bit smarter than a black box test that would just know about clicking. Um, the nice part about running in JavaScript as a runtime is that I actually know if I'm waiting for asynchronous code or promises, and I don't have to do funky things like we did in Selenium of wait for element present or sleep. If you've ever run into terrible test suites in Selenium, you don't have to face those with the acceptance test I'll show today. I also point out in uh, the second bullet point here that it's normally in the stack where you specify uh, how the AJAX request might be mocked out. So a lot of people ask when they're getting into test driven development, where do I mock the AJAX request or where do I do this particular thing? And this isn't a rule that's going broadly across all of these, but generally you'll see in the example today, this is where I, I mock out any network requests. It's obviously the slowest in the stack as well, although you'll see hopefully a little bit later today, it's not as slow as Selenium which is the benefit 
to running those in JavaScript. The next step down is integration tests, and again, this is the one that everybody has a different definition. Today, the definition is this. I have a web component, or I want to define a web component, and I want to be able to take a JavaScript object or some data, and I want to push that in as the model or some kind of JavaScript state, and I want the component to render HTML. That's it. If you've been doing programming for a long time, that sh this actually should be really appealing. It's much more like standard functional programming. Data in, HTML out, predictable, repeatable. There's no state inside of this thing. And we're going to test these in sort of their own little sandbox that lets us play with the HTML given a certain context. So these run a little bit faster than the acceptance tests I just talked about because we don't actually spin the entire app up. So there's a benefit here as well. Um, Finally, the last one here is unit testing. Everybody has, again, their own definition. Normally, uh, traditionally, unit testing is either one function or one class in isolation. What I'm going to describe today is a little different. It's actually the lowest test you can write as you decompose the problem. So that's just my definition for today, and there's probably a ton of other good reasons to, to be more descriptive. The reason I say it's the lowest level to decompose the problem is that some of the tests I'm going to write today actually interact with more than one object but I'm going to call it a unit test. So you can uh, argue with me later about whether that's right or wrong. <laughs> For now, it'll work. Uh, so why does it matter? I put this quote, uh, this not a quote, but uh, this interesting story about my mom years ago. <laughs> she, had, uh, she had her first iPhone and came out to my house. And I remember she was upgrading to iOS 7. I remember that was kind of a big deal before we all were like, oh, I wish I hadn't updated. That was kind of a mistake. <laughs> And so when she came out to my house all excited, she didn't have Wi-Fi, so she came to my house to pull that down. And I remember iOS 9 coming out recently in the last month or two, and I remember calling her and saying like, hey, uh, you're gonna update to iOS 9, you're pretty, you're pretty jazzed about iOS 8 and iOS 7. She's like, oh no, definitely not updating anytime soon. Every time there's a release, there's actually more bugs or more problems than there are features or things I want. I wish they would just stop releasing software. So. <laughs> To me, the challenge is really like, how do we ship software sustainably and not uh, sort of creep in all these bugs and really just issues? And we want to get users excited about the software. And I feel like that's the thing that's missing today. So if nothing else, that's the, the baseline. Um, one thing I want to call out to this is really all I have for the week slide deck, because the rest of it is live coding, is uh, everybody has their own journey into test-driven development. It, admittedly, what I'm going to be showing is you know, seven or eight years of iteration and improvement. So I'm going to try and express it from that angle that if you're new and you think tomorrow you can go run a marathon, but you haven't really run a 5K yet, that this is going to take some experience and some practice on your own. I just make it look good because, well, that's what I do. But also, I practice this talk a lot. So although what I show may be very appealing, if you can't get it right the first time you try it, don't give up. Uh, I started learning how to write tests back in 2007, and I'm still learning today. So, all right. So let's take a look at uh, first, like the the actual application that we're going to play around with and how this works. And it's a really simple. I'm not sure how blown up this thing is here. It's a really simple, like user administrative like app. And the first thing I want to call out is it's kind of like a CRUD app where I can click someone's name. Uh, the URL changes, and then I get some details about that user, and I can change some details and click this save button, the normal CRUD stuff you would see. And before we get into the test first or test driven approach, because some of this is so different, I want to show a little bit of test after just to get everyone familiar with some of the acceptance testing framework that I'll use. And to be honest, I'm using Ember. I'm not here to sell you on Ember, love it or hate it. Um, honestly, one way to not get anything out of this talk is just to watch everything I do in Ember and go, this should be in. React, you know, like really grumpy, you know? So don't do that. Honestly, if you don't like Ember, that's fine. Ember, in my opinion, just has the most mature testing stack to show this. I'm working in React now as well, and I hope I get to speak at ReactConf and show this same outside-in approach with React. It's just not as mature, and it's not as baked right now as what you'll see with Ember. Uh, in the Ember app, though, what I'm going to show is I'm going to come into a particular URL. So I'm going to come into the app slash users1, which you can barely see up here. That's basically the primary key. And I'm going to change this value down in here, whatever that name happens to be, to WAT, which is just the random Gary Bernhardt joke, if you know who that is. And then I'm going to click Save, and I get redirected back to this URL, back to users. And then in addition, the network tab tells the whole story, and that is, if I blow this up here, that is there's also sort of an AJAX request with name equals WAT at the super bottom here. So there's an AJAX request that fires off the updated name. And this is what we're going to show. All this software already works. 
So we're not going to do any tests first, but I want to walk through the process to test this after, just to get everyone familiar with how this works. Now, because this is a little bit more advanced and because everyone's very religious about their test runner and test framework, I'm using QUnit, I'm using Ember CLI. You don't have to use those if that's not your thing. I'm not going to spend time talking about how I set up Ember CLI and all that. That's sort of a very um, beginner setup. This is really just going to show how to use the tools to get feedback and add features. Um, and we'll get to that here in just a minute. So the first thing I'm going to do is open up this acceptance testing file that I have. And we're going to write this test, and it's not going to be any rocket science here, it's probably going to be pretty basic stuff, but I want to do it just to cover the basis. So here I'm going to just write a test that says, uh, what does it say, clicking save will fire XHR and redirect the user, something like that. And the first thing I want to mention is, since this is more of an acceptance test, there are a lot of helpers, or there's sort of like a bunch of uh, DSL, uh, sorry, DSL, Domain-specific, yes. There's a domain-specific language built into Ember for testing. And they call it Ember testing. I know, genius. Anyway, Ember testing just has a few helpers that I want to call out. The first one here is how do I go to a particular URL in the app to do anything? And this helper is visit. And I'm going to give us some breathing room here. So visit really just says go to the client URL, meaning I'm not going to fire off an HTTP request to the backend server. This is all going to be in the browser. So once the JavaScript app is booted, these requests sort of just change the internal routes. So the first thing I'm going to do is actually go to users1. And now I want to change something. I want to fill in that name, that input, with the word WAT. And there's another DSL for this called fill in. And it's detail name is a CSS selector for that. And I'm just going to put the string WAT to the right. Is this big enough, by the way? Fame? You can just boo if you totally hate it. OK. So I got to fill this in. And next, I have another helper that's going to let me click the Save button. And that's another CSS selector. And now, as I mentioned, we're doing this in the runtime. And I want to wait till the AJAX request is done and all the work is completed and redirected me to check the URL to make sure I've been redirected. So I have this nice uh, hook again called and then, which is really nothing more than a JavaScript function callback. And what I'm going to do inside here with QUnit is just assert equal the current URL, which is a nice little helper here, has redirected me to users. And so this is the entire test. I'm going to go to that. This is exactly what I just showed in the browser. I go to a URL, I change the name, I click save, I'm redirected. That's it. So let's save this and kind of see what happens from the test runner's perspective here. So I get a huge explosion, which is not what we had just two seconds ago when we didn't have this test. So the first thing I want to call out is on these higher level tests, sometimes you know, one of the trade-offs that people talk about test driven development is where do I write the test? Is it a higher level test, a lower level test? In my opinion, you need them all. And you'll see as we go through today by example, when do I need them and why? One of the challenges though with these high level tests is you don't have this really tight locale, meaning you don't really know where the error is sometimes. It can be everywhere, because that's what these acceptance tests do is they boot the entire app and then do something that integrates everything. So the first challenge I do is I usually look for the first error message. So the first error message I see is I actually have a 404 in here trying to hit API users. So I haven't given you the whole story. When the app boots, I do fetch some user data, as you'd imagine we would to show in this form. So the first thing I'm missing in my test so far is I haven't stubbed that out from the AJAX perspective. So I have this little helper that really just intercepts the AJAX request. And I need to stub out API users. And it's a get request. I want to return to 200. And then I want to return just an array, really just a, a JSON array. And that comes for this little helper I have called user, users list. And if you're like, Torin, I cannot proceed until you show me everything. It's really not that exciting. So it's just an array with like Torin, Brandon, and Jared. And that comes back from the AJAX request. That's pretty much it. All right, so let's save that and see what else we get here. All right, so the next error message, we have a lot less errors. So that's a step in the right direction. But the next error we have is there is a put request. And if you want to patch request or something, you can do that here as well. I just have a put in this example. So the put request is saying, I fired off API users 1, but no one listened, so I'm going to throw a 404. Meaning, really, that I just need to declare what that put request looks like. And this is sort of in response to the click save, right? So I click save, and I expect there's an AJAX request. It's kind of part of the contract that I'm de defining here. So I'm going to say uh, XHR is API users 1, which is exactly what I saw in the failure. The verb this time is a little different. It's put. I can return to 200. 
I'm going to return nothing because client side, I actually don't do anything with the data. In this example, I already have it client side, so I'll just say return nothing. But now comes the interesting part is when I actually have a post or a put, I can actually declare exactly what the data should look like. So I'm actually going to put into this Ajax request on the end, name colon lat, because part of writing this client side test is I know what's going to happen or what's going to be fired off to the back end. And that is I have this name parameter in the Ajax request, and now all the tests are passing. So that was very test after. If you were like, boring, I get you. We're going to get there. <laughs> so uh, what the, re yeah, the reason I wanted to show that is the very first test we have to write when I'm going to introduce this feature is going to involve some of this DSL, the Ember testing stuff. And I want you just to be aware of it and not have to like learn that and pick up the test first thing at the same time. OK, so here's what's happening in the app. This is the final app, I should say. And the final app has one interesting feature that my product manager has mocked up in this really great Photoshop mock that is the real app. I'm just lying right now. So anyway, <laughs> pretend this is like the mock up here. So I have this drop down, and in the real app today, I actually only have full name. So I'm, I'm basically saying I'd like to, a drop down where I can change a user's role to guest, and then click save, and I fire off an Ajax request that actually persists. They are now a guest user. Same sort of thing we just did with the name, except I need a select box and some static data and all that good stuff. So we're going to drive this feature from the ground up, test first, from this outside-in perspective. And outside-in is really nothing more, in my view, than test-driven development the way it was intended. So we're going to use testing, most importantly today, to get feedback as we go. I'm not uh, one of the religious testing people that says we write tests just to have tests anymore. Tests actually provide some real value. And, in, and what you'll see here in the next 45 minutes probably is the speed advantage of the feedback loop. I'm not just going to the browser and hitting refresh with every change. I'm letting the test either give me an error or the test tell me that everything is as I expect. So we're going to start out by just writing a failing test by really extending the test we already wrote. Because it's kind of the same test, right? The feature that the product manager wants is I come in, I maybe change the name, but I can also change my role. So the first thing we'll do is actually say fill in, and I will give it a selector of something that doesn't exist yet, it's called detail role. And I'm going to give it a primary key of three, mainly because three is the guest primary key in this example. In a real app, you might do something like this, create a constant and say like role, primary key, something like that. I'll keep it low bar, but you get the idea. So first thing I'll do is try and fill this in, and without any other steps I should get a failing test when this runs and that is because the very first piece of feedback I get is hey detail role is just not a thing so we need to go add that so the first thing I can actually do in the production app is if I go look at this particular template there's a, a handlebars file here is oops that's user detail same pretty much same template uh, but I need to add a select box of some kind in here so I'm going to add just the bare bones here with a class of detail role and what's the other uh, bootstrap thing? Form control, just to be handy here. So it doesn't, doesn't look terrible. So I'll add a select box, and now my test is passing. Pretty basic. The other part of this requirement, if you remember, and I'm going to try and make a point to do a better job. Somebody call me out. Somebody hold me accountable if I'm not doing good. But I want to uh, do a better job of keeping the test and the production code changes at the same, uh, visible at the same time. So I'm going to bring these back up so you can kind of see the changes. On top, I've got the handlebar side. On the bottom, I've got the passing test. Now, the part that's missing is the XHR is not complete. The product owner says that obviously we persist that role change on the back end. So what I'm going to do is jump in. In addition to name being WAT, I expect there's actually a role of three, because we're going to fire off probably the primary key to the back end. And that has to match what we filled in here. That's kind of the whole point of this test. So if I save this now, we're going to run into some trouble, because of course we're not firing that off. But I do get a nice little error. In addition to the 404, which is kind of descriptive, that I've, I've mismatched the, the Ajax request, I also get this nice little yellow stack that says, hey, the mock data, what we expected was WAT and the guest role of three, but the real production app only sent the name. I, don't, I didn't actually send off the role, so we have our first kind of failing test. Now, since you guys haven't seen this app, I'm going to walk through how do we get this data at all, because we can't reasonably keep going if we don't know what we're working on here. So, at the end of the day, there's actually a controller that just has a uh, kind of a update method in it. So let me bring up the user controller here. And all that really happens is I fire off update passing the user model. And on success of that update, I transition us back, which is also part of the test, as you saw earlier. So what's happening inside the repository? So I'm going to jump over and look at the update method itself here for user. And update's pretty basic. It's really just a put. But notice where the data comes from. This is the part that's valuable, is the model or the user object 
that JavaScript object knows how to serialize itself as it goes up to the server. So what we're actually needing to look for here is the user model. And you can see right now the user model is a little verbose on purpose just to kind of show how simple this is right now. We really just have the name. I have one property on this user model. It has a name. I send the name up as JSON. That's it. What I'd like to have to get this test passing is I'd like to say, well, I've got a associated role, and I'm going to say this.getRole.id. If you're seeing this.get and you're very angry, I feel you. It's the, uh, it's the badge we wear as Ember developers. I'm very sorry. I don't like it either, actually. So if you hate this, then we're in the same boat. But the idea is I actually just have a property that's observable. That's how this works in Ember. So really, I just want to be able to get the role's ID. Now, unfortunately, if I save this, I can see a reasonable impact because what's going to happen is I'm going to get role undefined down here. So one of the unsung rules of TDD is that you know, as long as your error message changes or you're getting some more information and the test is still failing, that's totally fine. I don't think the idea was ever intended that you're going to go from like horrible catastrophe to perfect passing test every time. So if you see some of that along the way, I think that's just normal. And what I've seen here is that I changed from role not there to role as undefined. Now, what this tells me as the developer is that there's probably some missing plumbing code, infrastructure code, that is the one-to-many relationship between user and role. There just there isn't one. So you saw when I was in the user, there's literally a name property, and that's it. So what's already happening in my mind, and I'm going to talk in the third person, not because I'm conceited, but so you can kind of work through this with me, is that I'm thinking now that as the product owner, this test would already be done if I had some of this plumbing code in there, right? But the plumbing code's not done. This is actually the test friction that I'm feeling. Is this test? I like this test to just pass, but there is a lot of code that has to be written yet. So let me call out a few. Let me bring up the test as well, just to show. Um, so the test, again, this acceptance test is very high level, assuming all the code existed. I just wire a couple things together, and it shows the glue code works, and we're done. Unfortunately, what you can see up here in the template is I have a select box that is nothing in it. And immediately, some things off the top of my head. So before I can actually make the product owner's goal, dreams, all that come through, I have a couple things happening. I have uh, what options show up here. No idea. There's no options at all. Uh, what option is selected, that's important because we have the admin and the, the guest, which one actually shows up. And then finally, what does the on change event do? And then a little bonus material. And what is this uh, one to many thing all about again? So those are four things that are floating in my mind as I'm developing this feature. And I should say, this is not, uh, this feature I'm driving out here is not scripted from nothing. This is actually from a real uh, feature I added sometime in the last six months at my current gig. So these, these questions popped up, and I was actually coaching someone at the time. And I said, you know, I feel like we have some other things that the acceptance test doesn't care about, but the acceptance test needs them to complete and be done. So what I'm going to ask us to do, which is going to feel very strange, is we're going to stop writing this test, because this test cannot be completed. We need a lot more code, we need a lot more infrastructure yet. So what I'm going to do is just pause and go back to my test runner. And I'm sure everybody's test runner has a way to do this. In QUnit, I can really just filter in this upper right dialog and say, you know what, acceptance testing right now is just going to be really noisy. This thing's going to fail for the next 20 minutes. It's just going to be in my way. Instead, I want to drop down and write integration test because as I described earlier, the integration test for the sake of this little discussion is really to define how a web component works. And that's exactly what we need to do. We need to go describe what the web component API for that select box looks like. So I'm passing. Everything's green for the moment. And we're going to drop down and write an integration test. So I'm going to get rid of these terrible comments here so we don't break anything. And on the bottom, I think I actually have an integration test that exists for user. I do. And the first thing I want to cover is just if you've never seen an integration test, Again, this is kind of an Ember thing, and everybody has, I do this in React just the same, but Ember's is a little specific where we actually have this render method where you actually pass in the dynamic web component as if you were a consumer or someone who used the web component. So what I'm doing on this line, and we're not going to use this test, but I just want to show, in this example, I actually pass in model equals model, and the line above it is actually just saying, hey, I have this JavaScript object called user. Well, what is user? Aside from the global store idea, it's really just that JavaScript object you see on the right in that object literal ID colon one. So at the simplest, because this test again is just super basic, it's just a JavaScript object with an ID. That's it. So what we're going to do is since we need to drive out all the select components of this user detail, we're going to basically drop down and write our own test here. And our test is going to say each role shows up as an option in the select, something really descriptive like that. 
And what we're going to do is not only set the model and, of course, render it, but we need one additional piece of information, and that's some kind of configuration about what the roles are. So a lot of time, at least in this particular app, uh, the roles are just static information that's kind of loaded on boot. So it's just always in memory, and it's you know a set of like three to five roles, admin, guest. So what I'm going to do is assume that I also need to set this up and pass it in. One of the uh, ideas I described earlier was that web components are really simple because it's just JavaScript objects in, HTML out. And the other JavaScript object we need to pass in is an array. So we're going to pass as an array of roles. So I'll have to create a local variable here in a second called roles. And I'm just going to, I'm going to get this from this kind of global cache just by doing a store.find a role. But before the global cache can return anything, I actually have to push a few things into it. So I'm going to push a role with an ID of two and a name of admin. And I'll push another one in here with guest. And I think guest is a primary key of three. And all this data is just made up, by the way. It doesn't have to match your production setup. I'm just using it here. Uh, so I'm using admin and guest. Uh, now I actually have an array of roles. And then what I want to do after I'm done is, unlike the acceptance test that had a lot higher level uh, framework to use those fill-in helpers and visit helpers. I'm almost back to jQuery here, love it or hate it. But again, one of the benefits here is I'm also not standing up the entire application, so these run a lot quicker. And so what I'm going to look for is detail role, which we already know exists. The acceptance test got us that far. But what the acceptance test hasn't done is drive out this first concern, is that how many options do I actually have showing up? So I'm going to say assert equal, component.findOption.length, and I expect there's two. Now that can't happen unless I also pass roles equals roles into the component itself. So in Ember, probably like other, uh, other frameworks like React or Angular, you have to pass that data in if you want some static data to show up down there. So I'm passing roles down and now I expect there actually are two options that show up. That's in fact the entire purpose and unfortunately C2 is not zero and we kind of anticipated that. We actually didn't have that working so I'm going to leave the test on the bottom here and do a better job. But I have now my options that are going to show up here. And in handlebars in particular, this isn't really uh, that required, but basically the syntax is each roles as role. You just wrap that in your option for now. And how dark is that blue? Oh, it's not bad. Okay, we can barely see that there. So now I'm going to actually loop or enumerate over those, and I get a passing build. So we're obviously a little ways away from completing that, so let's just kind of skip through to the next part of this, which is we have a value for the first option, hopefully, and that value should be a two. And then for the second one, just to kind of prove that we're in a loop here, I'll also get the three, and that should fail because I actually don't have any options. So you see two and three are just nothing because we haven't implemented that. And from the HTML side, it's just value equals, oops, not values, equals role.id. So I'm literally just going to plug in the dynamic uh, ID property, and obviously we pass that build, so we're good. We'll just kind of continue that process now for the other side of it, which is the actual text value here. Oops. And text value of these should be admin and guest. And those are, of course, going to fail, or we expect they do, because we just don't have any text. And of course, admin and guest are empty strings. And all this means on the options is I didn't add, or haven't yet added role.name. So that's really the production code. It's, it's just the simplest option to get the test passing, and that should pass our build. And it does. All right, so let's just kind of continue on this. So now I've got that first criteria met where the options actually show up correctly. But what about the selected options? So this test will be a little bit different. We'll say the selected role should reflect the user's role property, something like that. And we're going to change this a lot of it. We don't need a lot of the details we have. We're just really going to drop down and say the value for the selected option is uh, three. Now, one of the reasons I want to call out, I didn't, I didn't just pick three and get lucky here. I want to have a failing test, right? So first, let's just leave this as a two. And my test runner runs, but everything's fine. And just calling this out is because I don't have a placeholder. So what's happening is I just get admin role for free. So, but to avoid that and just to avoid messing with placeholders, I'm going to make the test fail by asserting that if I actually am a guest, I should have the guest option selected. And I do not, which is what it's saying. It's saying, hey, actually, I'm an admin. I'm not guest. What's up? So the first thing I have to think about, again, this is an introspection I'm doing, which is kind of strange for me. But 
The first thing that's happening is I have to now think about, again, some plumbing code that this web component is just relying or wishes already existed, and that is the relationship between user and role. And so the idea is that a user can have one role exactly, but a role can be related or associated with many users in the system. So what does this look like from the data structure? The perspective here is I have this user's array, and in the user's array, when I'm associated with one or many, I just put their primary key. So this is the simplest JSON to show that one-to-many relationship. Now, adding that, it's like, oh, okay, that should get me maybe a little closer. I haven't written any other production code. I'm still failing. So now what I'm going to do is actually jump up to the template, because if you know the HTML side of this, you're saying, Torin, you haven't done selected equals yet. What is up with that? So here's what I'll do. I'll say, well, I have this is equal, which is just kind of a helper to do quality for me. And really all I'm expecting in the is equal is that as I enumerate over the role, I have this role, I can check to see if its ID is also equal to the user's role.id. Because the user is actually the model. So I put user.model here or user.role when in reality it's model. Because if you look down here, I actually set a property called model. We know it's the user. This is like an emberism, so bear with me here. But ember just calls the main model model. And so this is actually the user. And ideally, I would set selected uh, equal to whatever the user's role is. Now, unfortunately, we already know that this isn't going to work because user.role.id is not a thing. And now I'm paused again with this question of, I, I have some friction here that I just wish this existed. The entire relationship, all the details of it, so I can keep going and be done. But I'm not. So I need to pause again and put this test on hold. And I'm actually going to jump down to the unit level because what I need to drive out is the relationship between user and role and then come back to this integration test when that exists. That API does not exist. Now you might be asking, why all the up and down? What is going on? And the real value here is that unlike back in the day when I used to start bottom up, I'd like work at the database and then get all the way up to the top. In that way, you're sort of guessing a lot of times about what the API you think the consumer of your thing will need. In this case, I know exactly what I need. My web component needs a one-to-many relationship that gives me the role if associated. If that is in place, the select box just works. That doesn't exist, but now I know the minimum code I need to go right in that uh, unit test, which is the relationship. So we're gonna jump down again. I don't have a unit test, so we're gonna write our own, and I'm just gonna call it the user model test.js. And to save a ton of boilerplate, I'll just kind of cheat here and drop in kind of a, it's just a Q unit setup, you're not missing anything here. But really just gives me some of the registration DI stuff that I'm using at Ember. The test in particular, so let me raise this up a little bit. The test in particular we want to write here is that the role uh, property returns associated model or undefined. Because there are kind of two cases. If I don't have a role, I expect that to be notified as well. Like a flat out undefined in JavaScript works just, just fine here. So what I'm going to do for the setup is first create a user just by saying store up push user. And I'll actually just, again, it's really just an ID. Next I'm going to push in a role object, which could be, again, our admin role. So we use admin. And to make this work, I'm going to already have it wired up out of the gate to be associated with this user. Now what I can do is I can go get that by saying equals user.getRole. So this is essentially saying I expect there's an API now where I can go ask for a property on, on user, and it's going to give me the associated role based on this backwards array, this one-to-many relationship. So unfortunately, we know none of that's wired up. So the first assertion I'm even going to write is just assert.ok which is really just a truthy assertion saying, this thing better not be undefined. I'm not gonna pass if it's undefined. So I'm just gonna pass in role. Now, unfortunately, we know it's gonna be undefined. That's kind of the whole point. We wanna just establish we're even running the right test here. So I'm running my test. The assert okay says, hey, it has to be a truthy value, and it's undefined. Sorry about that. But that's okay, because we actually expect that. And so the first thing I'm gonna do is leave the test code down here on the bottom. So if you're still following along, that's totally cool. And on the top, what I'm going to do is open up the user model that we need to actually add the association here. And you can see the user model is super bare bones. Literally one property, one function, and no, uh, no mention of role. So we have to add role ourselves. So we're going to use uh, Ember has this special computed function, but it's really nothing more than a straight JavaScript function that can cache the return value. So if you have a lot of people looking at this observed value, they're not paying the cost by going through it every time. So what we need to do inside this is actually look through the global cache to get the roles and then enumerate those and match them up to see if we are in that array. So the first thing we need to do is just say store, which is where we're going to kind of get this global hookup. So we'll say get store. So I have to add store here and kind of eject it. 
And then I'm also using Ember, so I'm going to import Ember here. Also using uh, inject below, so I'm going to import that. All right, so now once I have this, uh, the store has a little handy method that lets me return like an array. So I can say store.find role. So I want all the roles that match a certain filter. And so we'll declare that filter real quick. This function is going to be handed. Uh, the API is essentially it hands this filter every single role in the cache and then lets me filter the ones out that I don't care about. Now, how do I filter those out? The first thing is I need to declare this user's property by saying user or role that get users, which is going to give me coincidence, the user's array on the far right there. And that user's array is important because I know if my primary key is in there. So I'll say user ID equals this.getID. So that ID needs to be inside here. We could just use uh, a jQuery function called in array to say user ID is in users if it's greater than negative one. So this is really the guts of it. We're going to enumerate all those roles and then return the ones that match ourselves. And now we get a passing test. That passing test is a little naive on purpose. So the first thing is we went from, okay, it's a truthy value, which just means it's not undefined. That could have been anything. Now what I actually wanted was, I want to check to make sure, uh, you can see in the test name here, returns the associated model, meaning I expect this is a hydrated, rich JavaScript object, not just some one-time value. So what I'm going to do is actually say role.getID, and that should be a two. So if that role ID is a two, we're in business. Unfortunately, two is undefined. So the problem here is actually a mismatch between uh, the return value here is an array because it allows me to kind of loop over all the roles, but in reality there's only ever one role. So I'm missing one additional helper property here. So I'll rename this one to belongs to. And then the actual role property is really nothing more than an alias to look at the first object. So we'll say belongs to that first object. So now role is really just going to pull in. You can think of this from the pure JavaScript perspective as I'm getting index zero of the array that's in the belongs to, and now I get a passing test. So that was just showing the ID. This is kind of just a little verbose, but if I also wanted to see the name was admin, just to further prove I got the full model, which we do. I can't, I can't get a failing test on this, but we get a passing test. So uh, now I actually have that relationship wired up. That's pretty cool. The next part though, and I wrote this test because sometimes I get lost. I like to write the test name right away because I always forget like five minutes later what I was doing. So in this test name, the part I want to call out is the or undefined. So there's two, two sides of the coin. The first one is great. Everything's wired up in Mr. Happy Path land, but what about when it's not? So I have the role and I can actually set users to an empty array, which in the future might just be disassociate me from this. And then after that's done, if I get the role again by saying user, I get role, it should be undefined. So I do an assert dot equal roles undefined. And that's going to give us some trouble. It actually says you expect it undefined, you got this insane object proxy, never show this again. So what happened up here is, one thing I haven't shared is that this filter function is sort of being cached as well by Ember. So what I need to do is tell this filter function when it's time to recalculate or rerun this code to filter out who I am or who I'm associated with. And I can do that by adding users, which is really just the property on the bottom right. So what happens in this little find is there's a almost like a regular JavaScript function filter where whatever I want on the right side is the property that will break the cache. So if users, which is what I'm updating down below on the set right here, if I update users, please, please rerun that function. So now when I've changed, uh, changed the store find to break on the cache, I get a passing test. So now what this tells me is I have total confidence in the relationship that I've set up between user and role. Even if I change it, I know it'll change to undefined. So for now, it feels like I have enough plumbing to go back up to the integration test. So let's do exactly that. I'm going to come up and change my filter from unit to integration. Everything's passing. This is where people clap. Sorry, anyways, uh, <laughs> totally fine. No, we're not done. Let's save that for later. Uh, what happened here was we had a failing test. And it's because the API needed did not exist. And now it exists, and now my test just works. We're not done, though, so let's keep going here. Everybody still with me? Everybody move yeah. All right, cool. Here we go. So first thing I'm going to do is jump back to that integration test so we get a little, a little more familiar with that. The last test is really the on-change event. So I'm going to add the on-change event here. And we'll just say on-change will alter the user's role. That's probably good enough. And all I'm going to really do is show that I start out with a 3, I'm going to change to a 2. 
uh, when I change the value on component by just doing val to a two, and I have to do a trigger change. I know, sorry about this. So I have to do a trigger change to kind of tell Ember's data binding wake up here. And then when I'm all done, I expect the selected option is a two. Now I'm going to bring up top before I run this test, I'm going to bring up the components uh, HPS file real quick. So notice on the select box, there is no on change event. So what is going to happen here? I had a passing build and I still have a passing build. So the reason I show that is always be really skeptical of your own passing tests. Are you running the right tests? Are you trying to, uh, are you trying to do something that the test isn't set up for? In this case, what's happened is the actual HTML select, of course, has changed. It changes for free when I do a val in HTML, right? So this line here magically changed it. What I wanted to actually fail this is that the user.getRoll.id has also changed from three to a two. So if I actually trigger change that, they are also updated, and this is where we get into trouble. This is where our failing test comes in. And we see three is not two, just meaning we haven't altered it. So the first thing in my mind is from the HTML side, I need an on change event, right? So on change is an ember, it's just an action, we call it changed, and the value is target.value, which target.value is nothing more than this guy right here. So really what I'm saying is, hey, when you have this on change fire, please pass along the rule. Makes sense, right? We want to change the rule. So I'm going to change that, and again, this is where, you know, I'm not going to get a passing test, but I am going to get a new error. And this one is just saying, hey, somebody fired this changed event. No one's listening, though. So the on change fired, which was this changed function I added, but no one picked it up, which is great. So now I know I'm on the right path. My test is set up correctly, I just haven't finished it. So what I'm going to do is jump over to an Ember, love it or hate it, we have a separate JavaScript file. I know it's not the cool thing to do, but uh, there's a separate JavaScript file where you actually declare the event, and this will just be a function. And before I actually get hog wild and just implement it, I kind of just want to see if I'm on the right track again. So I got rid of that changed, was not picked up, and I'm back to two is not three. So this is that point now where I'm going to guess about the API that doesn't exist. And I'm going to expect that new role ID comes in. And if I do user is this.getModel, because I have the model available, I'd really like to do something like user.change role, new role ID. That would be really concise. And as the web component, this would be really handy if I could just lean on my good old friend user to make that happen. Unfortunately, user is a scumbag, and he does not have a change role function. So <laughs> We're stuck. Again, I could drive the rest of this out in the web component test, but the web component doesn't care about the details of this relationship or how change role works. It wants to be a consumer of that. So I'm going to pause or pivot again down to unit. And of course, unit, I think, was passing and we're good. Now what I'm going to do is drop down and just drive out the change role, see how that works. So up here, we'll go back to the model on top. And on the bottom here, we'll jump back to the unit test. And all we're going to do is write this first test that says uh, change role will append the user ID to new role users array. Because that's kind of how the relationship works. And one of the things I, I will call out here that's nice about pivoting down is, this is just my own personal experience, but when I'm at the web component or the acceptance level and I'm trying to get the test passing, I actually don't think, I feel almost guilty thinking about all the details that are really, really should happen inside change role because the web component doesn't really care. It just needs the one happy path, call it a day so I can be on my way. But one of the nice things is when I drop down to the unit level here, I sort of am guilt free and I can be the unit test programmer now. And I can push off all this guilt I have about getting it done as fast as possible. I can say, no, I'm going to do the job that the unit testing programmer would do, even if that's you the whole time, you know, just doing bouncing between these hats. So what I like about this is, again, I can think thoroughly about what should actually happen here. So what I'm going to say is, OK, I need a user again. So I'll say, so I'll push user. And again, it's nothing more than an ID. And here I'm going to say, role is store up push role. I'm going to have an ID of two. Sure, name of admin. And this one in particular, I'm going to start out with users as an empty array. So I don't actually have any users associated because what I want to do here is say user.change role, and I want to pass in this ID of two. And then when I'm all done, I actually want to do an assert.db equal, which is just a way to look at the array and say role.getUsers, that array now, should be updated to have the number one inside of it, which is basically just saying I'm associated now with this user. So let's run that test. 
see if we can get ourselves in trouble, and we do. The same failure actually we had at the integration level. So the first thing to do is, of course, go up here and add change role. Should get us a little bit further, just hopefully a good assertion. And so here's the good assertion, is I expect an array with one, but hey, users is still empty, sorry about that. So all we need to do is actually add the simplest code to get this working, which is a new role ID, get access to our friend the store again, because I'm using that over and over. And the store, again, is really just a global cache. And I'm privileged here where I don't have to make any kind of network request. This configuration data is always in memory. So I can assume that it's just living here. I can say store.find role with the new role ID. This will be new role. And then now, to get this test passing, you just say new role.set users is an array with user ID. And so we'll just say user ID is the second ID. So now that we have kind of the minimum code to get this going, we have a passing test now. The thing I want to call out is sometimes I like to iterate on my tests. And notice this word, append. That word right now is probably not correct because all I'm doing is resetting this. So what if instead I was associated with some fictitious users like 9, 8, 7, um, in hopes of driving out that I don't erase other one-to-many relationships when I have 9, 8, 7, and 1. So really, this is just to show that there's a side effect here. If I'm not careful, it'll ruin somebody else's good day. So now what I'm getting is a good error that just says 9871 is not what you actually got. And it just really helps me iterate on this, which is I need to get the existing. So I can say new role users is new role dot get users or an empty array just because I'm going to concat here. So new role users dot concat user ID. So now I'm actually uh, keeping the state that was there so I didn't ruin anyone else's uh, configuration and we're on our way. So that's kind of the first test. The second test here is we will also remove the user ID from the current role users array here. And this one's going to require a little different setup. So I'm actually going to have both user, uh, or sorry, admin and guest in here. And guest doesn't really matter. The only thing that really does matter is that I have uh, I'm already associated with the user in the admin role. So I'm going to say admin role, and then this one doesn't really matter. Then I'm going to change the role from admin to guest. And then I'm going to do a deep equal on admin role and assert that I'm only 987, which if I shoot over here, should be instead of 9187, I'm going to remove my association with this, and I'm now 987. And we should get a failing test because there's really no removal. Uh, code or any logic, so I still, unfortunately, am associated with that. So up top, what I'm going to do is say uh, old role is this dot get role, and then we'll say old role users is old role dot get users, and then we're going to basically filter ourselves out of this just by doing a regular JavaScript filter, and I'll basically create a new variable called updated old role users by saying old role users dot filter. It's going to give me a function with an ID because that's really all that's in that array. And I'm just going to filter it myself where I say user ID not equal to the ID I'm enumerating over. And then finally, the last step is hey, old role that set users is now the updated. Now, unfortunately, this is where it gets a little confusing. I thought that test was going to pass. I was really excited about that. <laughs> but notice the name of this test. Forget the error for a minute. It's the append test. So actually, I haven't done anything wrong. I passed the uh, removal test. What's happening is actually I found a regression. And the regression is that I don't actually always have a role. So what I want to show just by using this little trick in QUnit, if I put no try catch here, because some, somebody's probably asking, like, how and what is he even talking about here, is I actually get an error on this line that says, old role.get users. And unfortunately, old role in the append test is undefined. There is no role associated to start. So we just found possibly a regression. Let's say you go back and talk to your product owner, and they're like, actually, that's cool because we screwed up the database migration, so we need to protect against that. So what we're going to do is just protect ourselves with the conditional. And you can tell me I'm wrong later about, about why this isn't good. But I'll say, say, if we have an old role, go ahead and do all the old, old role stuff because right now you know, we may or may not have an old role. So anyway, that should get us a passing test that we do. All right, cool. So now we have the append and the remove logic, which is the full API for change user. What are the chances this integration test is just going to work? Sweet. 
Yes, you guys have got this. Okay. So now we're almost there, right? That was the, the requirements I drove out, which was what options show up, what is the selected option, what does the on change event do, and what about this one to many thing Torrance talking about? This is crazy. All those things exist. So we need to move up one level higher to the acceptance test. Now, before we do that, I want to jump back to both the component real quick just to show a very big change that we made. And we can jump down to the integration test here if we want. But the actual change is that in the integration test, we greatly modified as we were kind of defining what the web component would look like for this new role, is user detail now has a model, which is the user JavaScript object, but it also requires an array of roles, this configuration data. Now, I've already done the legwork to get the roles, but no production use of this component is set up correctly right now. So if I look across the system for user detail, there is one component in the production app right now, and you can see it has a little save button click thing, but there is no mention of roles here. I'm passing the user, but pretty clearly none of this is going to work if I don't also pass down roles equals roles. Where do I get roles? Well, they're not there for free. I'll tell you that. So the first thing we need to do is jump back up, and in Ember, there's this, this particular route file. Oh, I just screwed that up. Sorry. There's this route file. I'm going to have them all three going nuts here. And the route file usually produces the data for what you see above at the very top. So you can see right now, I really just have one model function, and I'm really just going to get the user. It says repository fetch by ID, but what I'm getting is the user. What I actually need is to also inject this role repository. I already have some of this code wired up here. And what I'm going to say is let's go get our role repository. And now we're going to return two things here. So I'm going to return the user and also the roles. And unfortunately, roles has a different repository that just has a fetch. Notice slightly, you know, fetch by ID versus fetch. This fetch is actually hinting at everything's in memory. There's no asynchronous background request going off to a server because it's all configuration data. Now, what I need to do since I'm not returning one thing is I need to return user. Well, I'll call it model just to be consistent here. I can return model and roles and then set up controller. This is all Ember stuff, so that's why I'm not really talking about it. But in Ember, once you have more than one thing, you have to sort of manually set those variables you see up top. So what I have to do here is say controller.setModel is hash.model. Stuff that really just doesn't make too big a difference for this, but I have to set the data here. All right, so now I've got my model and my roles. And what I want to do now is come back and run all the tests and see if I was lucky enough to get all those tests passing. And I did. So the part that I want to show is, again, just on the acceptance test, because I kind of skipped over. There was basically some really nasty failures in there that I didn't want to drag everyone through. So I kind of skipped ahead to, hey, I've changed the Web Component API. I better fix that. But at the end of the day, the product owner got the ability to change a name, a role, hit save, and have that persisted. So one thing I want to point out is I haven't gone to the browser at all. Anybody believe this works? Is the production app done? Is it good? Let's go check it out. So let me jump into Meetup here. Let's see if this actually spins me up. All right, so let's go to, because remember the first app I showed on 4.4 was actually like the completed app. I'm going to go to this new 4200 app, the one we've been working on, jump in, and I've got a Fabicon problem. But uh, jump in, and now I have my drop down. It has admin and guest. And notably, when I save it, if I come up here to the network tab, and I drill down to the very bottom. I not only have my name as other role. And that's it. <laughs> so any questions? No. Not him, sorry. I drove over with him. That was two hours, sorry. Anyways, anybody else? Yeah. Uh, how does uh, this Ember testing framework different from Jasmine? Uh, the DSL one I showed at the Ember testing side. Uh, a lot of those helpers just do things like trigger change on those inputs. That's what the fill-in helper does. It kind of does a val in jQuery and just does a triggered input. So it kind of notifies Ember there's some change that's occurred. Uh, it has some nice things like current URL that sort of lets you look at what would be the client URL without actually changing it in window location. So what you noticed is in the test runner with QUnit, it didn't mess with the URL when it was, it was bouncing around because Ember kind of swallows those things, but still gives you some introspection hooks to say, oh, the, the client route in the production app would be this. 
Uh, it also has some other cool stuff like visit that allows you to kind of go to that client route without changing window location. So it's more like Protractor if you're doing Angular or if you've done something like that. So in React, I kind of rolling my own thing that lets me do a higher level test like that. So. It's a real question, for real. Oh, real cool. Okay. Yeah, so um, all of your data lives in memory right now. Is there any option to persist that on the client side to disk in case someone unplugged the cord or something, you know, the computer? Oh, like local storage or something? Yeah, so, or yeah, uh, yeah. NXDB. Is there any sort of adapter you can plug into that? Uh, yeah, that store that you kind of, I kind of glossed over the store idea, but the store is basically an in-memory uh, local cache of JavaScript objects like Nick is trolling me about. And uh, yeah, you can certainly write an adapter that just on, you know, push would not only put it into memory, but also maybe persist it somewhere with that, because they all have to have a primary key. So as long as the primary key along with the type, you can hydrate that out, you know, on for offline or anything, probably, so. Good job, Nick. You can be mean to me later. <laughs> Somebody in the back, yeah. I, I totally agree. Yep. Yeah, it's it's a it's a balancing act. I mean, a lot of, of my younger uh, emphasis was on only acceptance testing because I felt like oh, I only feel confident if the whole stack runs and integrates. But in reality, what what I showed today was just I feel like every test has a different uh, different purpose. And the acceptance test, their big drawback is that they are more brittle. Um, the CSS selectors themselves, in fact, I don't use actual design CSS selectors in our production app. We have a special prefix, which is like T dash, which tells my designer, don't take this out because you're going to break the test suite. And he's aware of that. And we kind of talked about it as a team. But I think you have to trade that off versus not having those because they do provide some level of confidence that I think is missing at the lower levels. So you're right on them. Yeah. Yep. So one sort of correction I see people dealing with when they're working with that kind of like test first approach is how do you test something you don't conceptually understand in the first place? In other words, nobody could nobody who doesn't understand Ember could fully recreate the workflow you've talked about right exactly, now, yeah. like on this kind of a project. So how do you balance learning the concepts of the particular domain and application from your work you're working with, with also trying to like get settled up with this approach? Yeah, I, I think it depends on the person, their, their aptitude, their experience, and maybe almost sometimes what they have to unlearn, because we all have those bad experiences. And in, in my view right now, if it was a brand new person who's just not familiar with Ember or really much JavaScript or programming, I would not probably teach this approach, because this is, like I said, eight years in the works, very advanced. It has its pros, but not until you get over a cliff. You know, the learn, especially the learning cliff of Ember, to be quite honest, so there is a cost. But even if you're doing React or something with a smaller learning curve, you could pick up in a day as like Mr. Season Programmer or Mrs. Season Programmer. The, I think the, down, the downside of trying to do what I'm doing is you're just going to end up frustrated and say TDD doesn't work, which is not what I want. That's why I kind of earlier I pitched to everyone that what you're going to see looks like, it's really easy, hopefully, if I did it right. But don't, you know, don't feel frustrated if the first time you try something like this, you really struggle. Um, and the analogy that's really great is the marathon one where I don't run, my wife did for a time, but if I tried to go <laughs> run even a 5K right now, I would die, basically. So, you know, don't go run a marathon like you saw me do here. If you're just interested in testing or you, or you want to get familiar with it, just play with it from, like, the test after side, like you saw me, saw me do originally. Get comfortable with it as you're learning Ember or any other framework, server side or client side. Then when you feel comfortable and you just want to challenge yourself or your team and push yourself further, pick up the test first idea. I mean, there's still even times where I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to write a test for that. I mean, a lot of the drag and drop stuff is a big challenge for me now where, you know, I don't actually know the APIs that I have to stub out. And one thing I tried to show here today is I actually just don't do a lot of mocking, stubbing, or spying because those things, uh, in my opinion, they, they cause me a lot of harm later on. But people who do like the stub approach might be able to get a little bit further. It just it, your mileage may vary. It's probably the long story short. But. Okay, cool. All right. Well, shake my hand and give me a hard time later, okay? I got two hours in the car with this guy over here, so. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.